Greetings, my name is Trad Cotter and I'm one of the owners of Mushroom Mountain. And today I'm gonna to be talking about how I got started in mushrooms, how I built the mushroom business, and also the different opportunities with fungi that can really make a difference in the world. So I hope this is inspiring and encourages you to go out and start some projects with mushrooms. I am the author of Organic Mushroom Farming and Mycoremediation that was published by Chelsea Green in 2014. And uh, it'd be a great addition to your texts library if you don't have it. A lot of these ideas uh, were put into the book and I'm writing another one. So uh, we look forward to that in about a year or two. I got my start um, hunting mushrooms and uh, chanterelle was the first mushroom I was able to identify on my own. Uh, this was back in 1995, 1994, 95. So there wasn't a lot of information on the internet. So I had to go out and kind of fend for myself. And it's a wonderful way of bonding with nature and collecting mushrooms and learning how to identify is critical uh, in your base knowledge that you really need to have. I uh, started Mushroom Mountain in a four by six walk-in closet in Florida and uh, literally came out of the closet and moved to South Carolina and eventually put a lab in the house and then eventually moved into this huge warehouse space. So um, start small, good advice, and uh, build a business very slowly. Um, otherwise, if you have any hiccups or speed bumps along the way, um, the worst thing you could do would be to shut down. So just to encourage you to take baby steps and uh, your mushroom business will grow for sure. There's many different uh, areas in Mushroom Mountain. Again, we started um, in a little closet and just produced a few bags of spawn a week and eventually uh, built a wing in the house and uh, added a walk-in cooler. And, th and then we outgrew that. So we were really just a spawn laboratory mostly and then started cultivating once we got the warehouse space. Uh, lately, we've been working on remediation experiments, uh, micro-remediation, and also getting into different ideas that you could use with fungi, uh, mycotechnology, textiles, pesticides, uh, antibiotics, all these things I'm going to cover today. So right now we have our tissue culture library over, over 250 species of mostly native fungi from around the southeast. Um, many people who watch my lectures uh, submit uh, samples that are very unique um, across the United States. So we house those in the lab and we use those for trials. This is our uh, current farm and location. Uh, this is in Easley, South Carolina. And uh, once you drive in, it says welcome to Mycotopia. And then you come down, we're occupying these two barns here. There is a nature trail here. Um, filled with different mushrooms, and we purchased this 17 acres with this 50,000 square foot warehouse space for, for future development. And there's the warehouse when you come in. One of our first signs that we made uh, greets you there. You hook a left and you go down here to where the lab, uh, retail office, and fruiting rooms. And um, I love experimenting with cultivation, uh, especially low-tech cultivation. I did visit um, uh, Haiti in 2013 and have made several trips to Jamaica to teach the locals how to grow mushrooms on indigenous material with very little uh, infrastructure. So these are golden oyster mushrooms. Uh, I grew these in these nursery pots right after the earthquake in Haiti uh, devastated that island. So I was trying to figure out a method of growing mushrooms on just about anything anywhere in the world. Uh, Mushroom Mountain is split uh, with Olga and myself and uh, we've already started uh, separating the business into these different silos. Um, this was an idea given to us by an attorney friend of ours to separate the business and the intellectual property. So right now the, the, the farm is uh, cultivating, there's a spawn lab, there's a composting going on. That's one business in itself. Uh, number two is Mycomatrix. Uh, we got this one going and uh, two years ago and it's doing very well. Uh, that's the extraction business. Uh, uh, Micromediation actually happened third 
we've established this uh, wing. Uh, medical is ongoing and agricultural, meaning uh, we've got these uh, different silos set up for mycorrhizal research, um, antibiotics, um, um, pesticides, things like that. These are ongoing. So the three um, main branches here, one, two, and four, actually help funnel um, and pay for these others that are not profiting yet. Um, nonprofit, uh, I do a lot of um, pro bono stuff overseas to try to help growers and, and people with food and uh, water um, issues. And we also have a moonshot division, which is mostly the, the secretive stuff that hasn't yet been released. I did have the opportunity, which is really cool, to uh, meet with some of the engineers of the uh, Falcon rocket on the SpaceX team. And uh, we were discussing different ways of growing, potentially growing mushrooms in space. Um, met with them in LA two years ago. And uh, we did manage to send some mushroom spawn up to the space station in one of the Dragon capsules a year and a half ago. And we're still waiting on the data, which is kind of cool. And of course, you know, this is in my book um, about growing mushrooms in space. You know, um, anything that's sporulating is probably not a good idea. So we went to start looking at liquid culture. And you can do this too if you have a lab. Um, we've grown different species in liquid culture. And much like the tempeh model, uh, we've sterilized some beans here. Uh, tempeh, you don't really need to sterilize the beans because it's a sporulating mold. Um, but with the liquid cultures, it, you can use just about any edible fungus, um, and any edible mushroom culture to put on the beans. So once you get into liquid, you sterilize the beans and add your culture. And in just as little as four to seven days, you have this meatloaf-like cake which to me could be a game changer here because now that we've, uh, think about it. I mean, we're not growing conchs, you're not growing um, foamies and ganodermas and things to some of the uh, more difficult conchs to grow very slow growing. We can actually just culture them on mycelium and make these little meatloaf like cakes. So one of the things I do in my job is to screen the different fungi that are found for different physical properties. This is really important um, in many of the different areas of interest of our research. And when you find a mushroom, you might notice um, as you pull it off the log or the stump or the, the mulch um, that whether or not it has this binding effect. So this is one physical property called tensile strength. Um, it really does make a big difference to have mushrooms with high tensile strength. These are bundles or cords or rhizomorphs here that are tightly binding this material. And I'll tell you why this is important shortly. The King Strafaria is known for having a high tensile strength. This is 20 to 30,000 times its own weight. Uh, it's gripping the mushroom mycelium. But one of the things the King Strafaria does that I don't quite like is that it's very ropey and it tends to have a lot of holes that you see here. So it's not a great mushroom for mycofiltration of water. It's almost like Swiss cheese. There's much better candidates for mycofiltration. What you're looking for is a very tight network. This is a um, micrograph of mushroom mycelium and you see how the, they're cross-walling and the septa here. Um, so this is a basidium I see and uh, guild mushroom and you see that um, it's got very little space here and that's ideal when you're thinking about building a filter to remove bacteria out of free-flowing water. So what I did was I ordered a bunch of uh, bacteria into the lab and started looking at different mushroom strains, testing their tensile strength. Uh, Clemson University helped us with this and we're looking at high tensile strength mycelium that also are active with some of the bacteria that we put in, uh, staph, strep, uh, E. coli, salmonella, things like that. And once we started to score these, uh, we also rated them on the, the growth rate to solidify. So it, um, we did find that a lot of mushrooms were had a very high tensile strength, like this uh, maitake, but it was very slow to grow. 
So it was disqualified. So we, we come up and we look at the different mushrooms. Even the devil's urn scored pretty high, but it didn't have a very high antibiotic factor. Uh, Tiger Sawgill actually scored the best. So you see the ones and the twos across. Um, and turkey tail was a pretty close. Turkey tail and the Ganodermas were very close as well. So why is rate of growth so important? Because we need it to get do the job. Uh, to, once it's in the field, uh, slow growing fungus can be um, out competed by competitors. So what we want to do is, uh, this is the mushroom mycelium of morels. But the problem with the morel culture is it's too weak. Um, if you flow water through it, it just kind of falls apart. It does not hold mulch together at all. Uh, after the BP oil spill, we released this poster down to the Gulf. Uh, if you do have a problem in your area, uh, just put, put together a little community action plan. Um, put up posters, get on the radio, do what you can uh, to try to get people involved. Uh, anyone can help the Gulf oil spill. That's what it says. You don't have to be a scientist to find a mushroom um, in a salt tolerant environment. You know, So people are happy to actually have a purpose to contribute to mycology. So yeah, just get the word out and uh, people are glad to help. And sure enough, you know, we have salt tolerant mushrooms turned in. These are from the dunes in North Carolina, growing right on the dune, right on almost in the lapping surf here. So that was the challenge with the BP oil spill and future oil spills is that we really need to get salt tolerant fungi into culture. All right. We need to have those there as part of the cleanup options in our toolkit. Mushrooms can break down hydrocarbon bonds. Everyone should or may not may know that by now. Um, they're they're amazing, but what good is that fungus if it can't operate in a high saline environment? So that's what we're looking for. Uh, if you find mushrooms brackets on driftwood or um, uh, mangrove uh, stalks and things like that, that's what we're up to right now. And ten turkey tail has a very high tensile strength, so that's good. Different Ganodermas are also very good, um, not only for high tensile strength, but they've also shown to break down some pretty pretty harsh pesticides um, in, in the trees. Uh, Lentinus lepidius, I think now it's Neolentinus lepidius. Uh, this is a strain that we've cloned. Um, it's very easy to identify. It usually grows off conifers or conifer wood. This is a brand new treated post uh, with uh, you see the scales growing off it still had the Home Depot barcode on it and when you look underneath it it's, it's iconic about this one and it's easy to ID is it has these saw gill like or serrated gills so if you see a mushroom that's gilled has serrated gills kind of a scaly cap growing off of a conifer or wood it's probably the train wrecker which is lepidius so this is a very interesting mushroom with a very interesting um, set of enzymes for breaking down different bonds of different chemicals, even in treated wood. And these are some uh, wild tiger sawgill here. This is one of my favorite new fungi for many different applications. And here's another shot here of them growing in the wild. They're pretty widespread. I found them all over the southeast, uh, down into Texas, uh, abroad over in Jamaica. They're, it's definitely a tropical. Um, it grows up into, all the way up into Virginia. But um, it's, it is edible, the cap is edible when it's young. The stem is super tough. And that might be a clue to you that it could have high tensile strength, which it did. Uh, the tensile strength of this one was uh, 800,000 to 1 million times its own weight, which is by far uh, the strongest that we've seen. So what, how can you use uh, these fungi? Well, a uh, perfect, perfect example here would be for uh, shoreline restoration here. Uh, you could call this mycoremediation because it is helping the environment, um, but you could sprinkle the spawn over the top of this burlap and then it would stabilize this. You could put wood chips down and um, plants, uh, borderline aquatics here to eventually develop a, a hard, uh, very well knit root system to stabilize this shore. So using uh, mushrooms and plants in combination uh, for, for areas, especially like this with a, with a high slope um, and the water runs off, you fill this with uh, mushrooms and wood chips and even inoculate 
the booms here uh, with a different species would be a good idea. And then plant your plants on the upside of these little swales here. And that would help with uh, uh, stabilization of that slope. And native grasses would be a good, good uh, choice here. Uh, very drought tolerant, uh, very low maintenance. So when we start talking about the microfiltration of contaminated water, um, we want to use a species, hopefully, that's edible, right? So uh, someone that's able to eat the mushroom and also uh, a fungus that is high tensile strength because it has to be able to withstand the water flow here through. So these are production uh, pots, but they can also serve as microfiltration modules or units if you flow water through these uh, put them in trays and recirculate the water. Very easy to do. Now I'm talking about, when I say microfiltration, um, if it's a bacterial contaminant, the mushrooms that pop out are going to be edible. But if you're dealing with a chemical pollutant, um, that would have to be recirculated over and over, uh, which could be a period of days, weeks, or even months uh, to get that water clean. The problem with that is the fruiting bodies that come out of a uh, chemical-based contamination may be compromised, but we're still uh, trying to figure out what happens to the chemicals if they do assimilate into the fruiting bodies. Um, right now we're still running a few investigations and we should have a paper coming out um, hopefully by this summer. So what kind of media do you use with uh, microfiltration? You don't use the fine stuff. This is sawdust. That's better off at the lab. Uh, we use wood chips of different sizes. We actually screen it now so it's nice and uniform. Uh, we ended up mixing it with different things like sand. Sand was too heavy. Uh, it really made the filters heavy, so we started mixing this with perlite. Uh, we tried activated charcoal and it, that didn't really help it at all. So we like to mix this with perlite, soak the chips, and then spawn it. So this is a graphical um, example of a uh, bench top unit that's recirculating where you have this can be trays and it's all scalable so you have a tray here you have your media it flows you have a pump and a reservoir it pumps the water over the top one and then gravity feeds you have a filter here to keep the holes from clogging a little drainage goes through another module and back back down into a collection module and recirculate it up all right if you want to scale this up this could be a lake this could be a, a 270 gallon tote, another 270 gallon tote, and then back into the lake or pond. So everything's scalable here. Oh, you also have to put this pump on a reciprocating, um, like a timer. It can't flow all the time. So we found that you could run this for 12 hours and it would turn off for one hour, let the mycelium breathe, and then it can come on for another 12 hours. Some of our contaminants of interest abroad are Vibrio, uh, Vibrio cholera. There's been some outbreaks in the world. Uh, a lot of people dying, a lot of children uh, dying because of the drinking water. Drinking water and mosquitoes kill um, more people on the planet than anything else, the leading cause of death. So we're trying to figure out how can we uh, build these cheap, inexpensive biological filters to filter out dangerous pathogens out of drinking water. And what's fascinating about Vibrio, the cholera, is that it actually binds to chitin, and chitin being the uh, uh, fungal cell wall uh, uh, composed of chitin in a matrix. Um, so this particular Vibrio has an adhesin that actually sticks to chitin like a magnet, which works really well for microfiltration. Not only is it physically trapped, um, it will actually adhese to chitin and stick to it like a magnet. So another um, uh, use for high tensile strength mycelium, this is something we came up with um, two years ago. I, we started mixing in uh, clay and tiger sawgill. We were lucky to have the National Brick Research Center only 15 minutes from the farm. So I went over there and met with the professors. Uh, there was Clemson uh, University was organizing this and they let me use all their equipment and the equipment mixed and uh, monitored the moisture control 
and um, dispensed it into these uh, wheelbarrows, which we moved over to a hydraulic press. So this is a clay mixed with living tiger saw gill mycelium. And the hydraulic press um, created these um, very dense bricks, right, that are mixed with living mycelium and clay. Now, uh, once these bricks are removed, they still have moisture. Typically, um, the bricks, the research center would have moved these into a kiln, but we decided to keep them alive for a very good reason. There's little Heidi. Uh, we made about 400 of these bricks and uh, we moved them into a moisture chamber, so we wanted to keep these alive. And what we saw, um, what we saw basically was that if we allowed them, this was only at 10%, so this is one of our uh, first tries at it, and um, we ended up increasing the mushroom mycelium here, but it actually colonized pretty good. Um, this is tiger saw gill colonizing, almost like giving this brick a chemical or biological rebar, but more importantly, since these bricks can stay alive for up to a year without one drop of water, our end goal is to make these uh, sto uh, storable, dry, and then being able to take them to the field <clears throat> or in a developing country, um, just dipping them in water and stacking them on top of each other, and then it wakes up the mycelium and then the bricks fuse together like living mortar. So it's a carbon negative brick. We also started mixing clays and composites and making um, pizza ovens. That's not just clay. Every single bit of this, there's uh, tiger saw gill mixed throughout this um, media. And we started making larger ovens. Uh, all this is uh, myceliated clay and ended up using um, myceliated clay and straw, which is like cob and also the myceliated bricks as the inner shell of this very large pizza oven. So there it is being stacked on. That was pretty cool. I mean, that's like the, I believe it was the world's first myceliated clay pizza oven, but that's something you can do uh, easily. Uh, try, try experimenting with composite living biological or mycological materials. Another idea I had, this is straight out of my book. This was not only fun, but uh, it's, it has a very good utility. And uh, this is a cutting board, a wooden hardwood cutting board. And <clears throat> I uh, decided to soak it overnight and smeared um, shiitake fungus all over it and put it back into a breathable bag for about a week or two. And then it started to brown. And essentially what happened was the fungus drilled its way into the surface, the entire cutting surface of this board, and then I just peeled it away, uh, the excess. And now I have uh, created the world's first natu or mycologically active cutting board, uh, which is resistant to um, strains of E. coli and salmonella, if you were to streak uh, them on there, which makes it nice. Um, now this cutting board will stay alive for up to a year without one drop of water. So essentially this cutting board I made in 2013 is still alive because I have been giving it a little bit of water uh, every year, not enough to rot it. Um, if we kept this wet, it would probably fruit shiitake mushrooms in a couple of weeks, but we don't want to do that. Another idea um, is to harvest spores and uh, you can do that on a glass or a mirror. Spores are adhesive when they come out because they're looking for stuff to stick to. They don't want to float around all their life. So they're adhesive and they're landing. So what we do is we let them dry on a mirror and then scrape them up into a big pile. And what we did was uh, we were able to um, create an ink out of this, put it in an inkjet printer and then print living ink. And you can look at this, it's 100% spores. <clears throat> and if you look at it under the microscope, you'll see the, the typeface here. Might need to come up a name, a new typeface name, right? like shrooms or something, I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway, if you look at it, and what do we try to do is basically create um, a destructive packaging, you know, uh, ink, living ink, uh, where these spores, as soon as they germinate and get wet, then you can compost this and these come alive, they mate, and then they start to take over the uh, package, which could be cardboard, paper, newspaper, and uh, black black ink is the, the most widely used ink. So I figured this would be a great 
uh, living replacement is to come up with living inks for short-term consumer products. Uh, the other area of interest that we have is the uh, agricultural, or, or you could even call it medical sector, with um, zoonotic diseases. But uh, these are entomopathogens, um, cordyceps fungi, or an example of entomopathogens. These are uh, <clears throat> In insects that are infected uh, either through ingestion of the spores or the, the spores drill their way right through the cuticle and then uh, mummify the insect and out comes a mushroom. Very cool. These are some of the most fun to find. Uh, that's why I like being out in the woods. I don't really hunt um, mushrooms anymore. I mean if I see them I'll pick them but I'm really interested in finding things like this because these are buried. They're not sitting out like this. This one was completely buried in the wood up to about here, uh, and all of this had to be very carefully excavated to find the host. Uh, so this was the only part that was exposed from here up. Now, the idea here is that uh, these fungi are very specific um, as to which insects they target. This is a cicada nymph. <clears throat> it's a very rare um, find, actually. It's only been found a couple times. And I found this by accident when I was photographing another mushroom on a log. So I was not looking for this. I mean, look how small it was. The only thing protruding out of the log was um, from here up. So it was this tiny, tiny little thing, just a couple millimeters long, uh, found in a mossy log. So um, cordyceps can have an anamorph stage, which is a mold state. If you want to think of it like that, it's like a figure eight. And once the host comes along, um, they can change, uh, infect an insect, and then they can actually develop a fruiting structure called a teleomorph. All right, but not all entomopathogens produce a structure like this, like Bavaria, uh, things like that, uh, Metarhizium. Uh, this is an ant that I found uh, behind our house, and it shows you the uh, what happens is behavior modification. So the spores, <clears throat> either ingested or piercing the armor or the cuticle of the ant, uh, steer the ant up to a branch and then um, the ant bites into the branch and then uh, the fungus gives it lockjaw, melts the jaw muscles apparently, and then secretes a toxin. The fungus actually enters the branch and goes into the vascular tissue of living tissue to mine nutrients and water and it streams it back up to the fruiting structure. So that gives the cordyceps mushroom enough energy and water to actually produce one of these structures here. Uh, now I turn this upright. Um, these actually fruit upside down and they position themselves over the top of uh, the pheromone laden highways that the rest of his friends are using. So it's not random. Um, something is driving these things to infect more of themselves, which is creepy and cool at the same time. Here's another glamour shot. It's a very bad hair day here, uh, folks. And um, if you're looking for a Halloween costume next year, this is it. All right, cordyceps mushroom, zombie ants. This picture was by Daniel Winkler, who came down to our house, and I showed him these uh, ants. This is how they fruit, okay? So they fruit upside down. So if you're looking for these, uh, your eyes, you can scan the branches of trees, typically anywhere from uh, two feet above the ground up to eight feet above the ground. It's a very narrow window in the canopy. They don't uh, like to fruit low to the ground. They don't like to fruit up high. It's like a Goldilocks zone um, that they're, they're placing themselves in. This was the first cordyceps I ever found. And again, I, I was not looking for cordyceps. I did not know that they were even in the area. Uh, it seemed like something off of um, BBC or something that was in the Amazon, you know. Uh, never thought there'd be cordyceps in the Carolinas. I found this one by accident, and once I dug down, I actually thought it was a Xylaria because look at it, but it was brown. Xylaria typically have a black and then a white tip, but it was brown, and I went back to the log and I dug up this beautiful black carpenter ant. So I was just it's just like I won the lottery. Here's the structures coming right out of her neck. And uh, I did take this to Clemson University and uh, actually sent it to 
Dr. David Hughes, who's now at Penn State. <clears throat> if you look up Dr. David Hughes, Penn State Entomology Lab, uh, you'll see his work. It's fascinating. But uh, he said that uh, he has not seen this fungus and this ant together in any herbariums uh, since 1907. So uh, I was had the first reported find here since 1907. So we took some of this tissue out of her abdomen and her leg, and then we cloned it. So we got it onto media, and I keep uh, taking the tips here. You got to be careful when you are um, maintaining these fungi because they can lose interest. This is not what they're used to eating. So eventually I had to mix in, um, make ant auger, which is basically um, bodies or body parts of ants mixed into this media so it can re have cuticle recognition and keep going. Otherwise, if you keep copying it, it may lose the ability to infect that insect. I caught more uh, black carpenter ants, uh, put them in galleries, introduced the pathogen, and sure enough, uh, Cook's postulate here proves that this is the pathogen here. So it mummified this black carpenter ant in about five to seven days. Uh, eventually we started to look at how ants are raised. Uh, especially in space. I was interested in uh, how they do it in space, but um, more importantly, I wanted to watch. I wanted to watch what happened. I wanted to watch the behavior of this pathogen, uh, antimopathogen affect the ants. So we made fire ant farms in the house, fire ant farms in the house, and introduced the pathogen. Now, this was calculated. I just didn't randomly um, set this up. Uh, I looked at a a uh, clay chart showing the uh, likeness or the evolutionary likeness of these two groups, Campanotus and Solenopsis. Um, Solenopsis being fire ants, Campanotus being the carpenter ant, and they're very similar uh, or branched away very closely. So this carpenter ant fungus was deadly against the uh, fire ant fungus that you see here. It mummified them in about four to six days. And uh, if you don't know what fire ants are, they are um, very problematic. They do about five to eight billion dollars in damages in the United States every single year, and they're spreading. Uh, with climate change and global warming, um, they are spreading um, further and further into different areas of the United States that are having milder and milder winters. Um, this is how fire ants should look, uh, all mummified. You can see how it's coming out of the hinges and everything, but yeah, it'll actually wipe out a mound in just a couple days, this fungus. So why is that so important? It's because we really need to replace chemical pesticides. It has to happen. It's estimated that we are going to lose 40% of all insect species, the largest kingdom on the planet, and it's directly related to habitat loss and pesticide use, which is human activity. It's almost disgusting. It's not almost, it is. And um, so it's, it's not that hard to find these insects, uh, even without a lab, is to take these and then grind them up and make your own pesticide, even with ordinary kitchen equipment. So you can find these insects, streak out the spores and get an isolation. Right, that can be done in the lab. Um, or how about this? How about finding the insects and making your own or showing people how to make their own? And what's good about this is that you found the insect, the host, with a fungus that is target specific for that host. Now it might kill other insects, but it's not like a pesticide that kills everything. You know, so the likelihood that this metarhizium growing on this grasshopper killing a bee would be highly unlikely highly unlikely, which is a great advantage. This was in a um, training workshop over in Indonesia. Clemson uh, set this up and um, showing them how to uh, find locusts in the field, grinding them up with a mortar and pestle, and then spreading the spores throughout the grains here. All right. And now they're sharing it. Now they're making their own biological weapons here for their fields so they don't have to purchase 
pesticides, the pesticides go into the drinking water, and then they're drinking the water and the villagers are getting sick. So enough was enough. You know, they figured out how to do this. And now that they are able to get this into culture, again, these molds spread very easily. So they're easily cultured um, in very primitive conditions. And now they're sharing these two cultures, Bavaria and Metarhizium, all right, with other villagers. So now they're able to make their own pesticides, which is great. Um, one of the things that happened uh, to me while I was in school and also at the EPA is that uh, I threw away, I had some plates contaminate. There was this aspergillus on the plate and I threw them away. And then um, I came back and I was emptying out the lab garbage. These were in Ziploc bags. And I noticed that this fungus was surging over the top of this other mold, this other competitor. I thought that was fascinating and I'd never seen it before. So I took these pictures and it got out of symmetry um, anyone who's cultured mushrooms know that they're typically symmetrical. It stopped growing symmetrically completely all the way around and just surged. It spent all of its energy surging over the top of this mold. So I took some really good high res pictures and then I started to zoom in and notice something else. But what you notice is it looks like an invasion, all right? Mushrooms are territorial and um, they do not, they want to take over their area. You know, they do not like competitors. And then I noticed, I zoomed in to check the resolution and I noticed all these droplets. Well, I looked all over the rest of the plate and these droplets were not present. So what this is telling me is that this fungus was creating its own natural antifungal, which is antibiotic substance in the metabolite that it was sweating over the top of this mold. And so we started setting up more and more experiments like this, and it was all the same. We kept seeing these metabolites at the competitor sites. And this was the mold just a couple days later. Look at all that fluid, right? Yeah. Concentrated on that competitor, just carpet bombing it. You know, it wants it gone, right? So what that was telling me was this fungus was capable of dialing up a target specific antifungal compound designed to kill that specific organism, you know, and it would produce something totally different in the presence of bacteria, which is interesting. So mushrooms are like factories. And what was that fungus? That was <laughs> very unusual. That just happened to be a jack-o-lantern, a poisonous mushroom that we were growing as an ornamental. And we had no idea that it could do these things. So that's what's fascinating to me is that you really have to understand that when you're out in the woods and every little crust, uh, cup fungus, gill mushroom, polypore, every little fungus you see has a gift. We just don't know what they do. That's your job <laughs> for the rest of your life is that you have to help contribute to this body of knowledge. You know, I know that's why I'm here, but there's millions of species of fungi and you know the, the, we really need to dig deep into this kingdom and figure these out i love every single mushroom i find you know it doesn't matter if it's edible poisonous deadly they all have a gift and what's interesting is that every strain of oyster mushroom is different every strain of turkey tail is different they're genetically different some produce a lot of different compounds and some don't. They're, they're like people you know. You know, some people you know can build a house. Some people can bake a cake from scratch. And there's people that can't. Um, there's some people that can do everything. Um, so we're looking for not only specific specificity, such as a fungus that only attacks a fire ant. That is great. That's a great find. But now we need... Um, opportunistic fungi, something that does broad spectrum things like produce antibiotics. So we set up this gallery here, fungus and bacteria. There it is. Uh, there it is right there. That's a uh, shiitake fungus and there's two pellets of E. coli on this plate. And after three days, 
uh, we'll see uh, multiple replicates the same thing. The uh, bacteria E. coli speeding its way over here. The two pellets met here. All the white you see are dead cells, live cells. So this looks kind of windswept here, but what you see is the something is going on here in this inhibition zone. Um, every single one. Uh, so this fungus had to be diffusing some low molecular weight substance, uh, something that was antibiotic into this medium. And that's a shiitake fungus. There's millions of fungi out there. What else, what else can they do? So the, the typical mode of drug discovery is to find a fungus um, and then make an extract out of it and then try it on different bacteria or cancers or drugs, things like that. All right, this is totally different. The problem is it takes 200 to $600 million just to get a drug approved or on the market. Uh, it takes a long time, a lot of trials, a lot of money. All right, it could take 12 to 13 years to do that. The problem is once you get a drug to the market, like an antibiotic, uh, the bacteria can figure it out in as little as two to two and a half years, making drug resistant organisms. So what are we left with? Um, streptomycin, you know, um, vancomycin, methicillin, you know, now we're having to stack or what's called multi-drug um, treatments. And now the, the drug, resistant organ, it, drug resistant organisms are becoming multi-drug resistant. It's terrible, right? And Fleming back here, um, in the 1920s and 30s, he said, you know, if we overuse antibiotics, they will, there is a risk of drug resistance. And boy, was he right. You know, we've been misusing these things for years. And now antibiotics are just about in everything. You know, they're in cattle feed. Um, we over pump the livestock. We cram livestock into these little cathodes and, um, very poor living conditions and we juice them up with antibiotics to keep them alive otherwise they would get sick so now we're eating this stuff uh, and it's getting into our water so then we have um, drug resistant staph that's clindamycin that's the regular strain so what i did was i ordered a bunch of different bacteria and ran a few trials with drug resistant staph over at uh, clemson using their um, biosafety 2 labs And here we go. I mean, it's in the news every year. There's something new. Drug resistant bacteria, flesh eating bacteria, drug resistant fungus, <laughs> COVID, you know, 19 There's going to be other. It's like, it's uh, how they, they were, how are they becoming super bugs is because of our lifestyle, you know, very poor uh, nutrition, um, overusing drugs. So they become antibiotic resistant really quickly. So what I like about Einstein's quote here is we can't solve our problems with the same thinking that we use when we created them. We have to, um, our brain got us in trouble and we need a back door. You know, we need a, we need a loophole here. We need to find a different angle on these solutions. So uh, about a year after I was looking at those plates that were attacking the mold, um, I just, you know, took a chance and I'm like, well, that was just a couple drops on a plate. What if I wanted a lot of it? So I made these bags and shaped these into little wells. And that fungus, again, I was choosing a high tensile strength fungus because I needed it to hold water, actually. Um, I didn't want the water to flow through it. So it was hydrophobic in a way. So I chose Fomis fomentarius, and also not just because of the tensile strength, because of its, um, reported antibiotic um, properties that it had against E. coli anyway. So there was already some papers out on the activity. So after we made a few prototypes, um, this is uh, still an, this is an older one, um, just to show you what, how we kind of got to where we're at. Um, this is sitting up on a riser. It's a block of mycelium, injectable ports for putting pathogen in, injectable ports for pulling antibiotics out, right? So we put in a pathogen, and then we'd hydrate the uh, the cake here. So the idea, if you can grasp this, is that um, what we are seeking is a patient-specific, target-specific 
uh, antibiotic factory in a bag that can produce an antibiotic within 24 to 48 hours that's target specific just for the patient and it's safer for the the natural bacteria that's in and on your body all right it's not a nuclear weapon it's not broad spectrum poof and it kills everything you know we are like coral reefs and we have to be more target specific in our approach to medicine as well just like the fungus that targets the fire ant what if we can produce a laser guided antibiotic to kill that specific pathogen yeah everybody that walks in the door then we're not dealing with this antibiotic resistance crap you know what I mean so um, for my birthday I ordered <laughs> to give you an idea of what I want for my birthday um, for my birthday I ordered E. coli salmonella uh, strep um, pseudomonas candida uh, different staph strains and uh, pneumonial strains happy birthday and then I uh, injected them into these wells this pure culture with a nutritive solution and then uh, the magic happened in 24 to 48 hours the bags with the pathogens flooded with the natural antibiotic here right this is their first trial all these are controls there's five replicates for each pathogen so we were able to pull this metabolite out and then all we had to do was test it really I mean we had uh, E. coli so we can drop them onto plates we can test inhibition what was really interesting is that um, it doesn't look like a lot here but this 20 milliliters was actually when we diluted it uh, 10 to the sixth was still active against E. coli so it was still able to inhibit so that 20 milliliters here could make 528 gallons of antibiotics uh, what's interesting is that not only was it working on bacteria it was working on uh, fungi which means it could also be used in a field uh, with a plant pathogen as well so not only medical now we're talking agricultural solutions that are target specific and so then then uh, we just started testing all the strains that we had so my talkie remember I said every single mushroom fungus has a gift it could be a mold it could be a, a crust fungus it could be a cup fungus. everything it's almost an infinite reserve of different compounds that have not been discovered right this is on a riser all these metabolites come out within 24 to 48 hours imagine going into a hospital and getting a throat culture or biopsy and picking up your antibiotic the next day you know the mushroom makes it for you so we've got uh, these are some older trials but just shows you that shiitake was active against staff uh, I will tell you that probably the highest scoring one against staff was uh, chicken the woods jack-o-lantern and orange mock oyster which all just happened to be orange mushrooms that mine sulfur from their environment and staph is highly susceptible to sulfur based drugs so it makes total sense here all right but shiitake did okay but those other orange mushrooms did the best uh, turkey tail did really good with salmonella so if you're making a cutting board that's probably turkey tails the best one uh, ganoderma which is reishi mushrooms uh, scored the highest against streptococcus pyogenes that would be your strep throat cultures and so all we're doing here is uh, this is just a setup shot where we're getting ready to test um, I could tell that's shiitake because it's brown but uh, testing against uh, tetracycline uh, clindamycin like other different antibiotics that are already on the market to see to test and compare uh, zones of inhibition I love teaching I love teaching abroad I would encourage you if you are good at growing mushrooms if you're a good speaker or, or even not if you're a good volunteer get out there and help help in your community here try to help in communities abroad I mean the 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 villages abroad are breeding grounds for pathogens that are eventually going to end up here so it's in our best interest to get out and help everybody right refugee camps disaster sites bring mushrooms to their world if they're not familiar with it 
This is my trip in 2013 down to Haiti with Clemson University. Uh, I went down there with 20 something students and we set up little growing rooms and taught them how to grow pink oyster mushrooms. And uh, they were just fascinated by mushrooms in general. Haiti is a mycophobic um, country. They only recognize one mushroom in the country called John John. It's a little south of red, a little brown mushroom they use to flavor rice. They're deadly afraid of every single other fungus on their island. They don't touch it, they don't eat it. They consider every other mushroom dangerous. So it was a very hard sell to get them to look at or even try oyster mushrooms. But once they tried it, they loved it. And this was my favorite. We found these oyster mushrooms growing on an old mango log. And um, I have the chefs, uh, the locals there cook these up and they, they almost refused to cook them up because they thought I was gonna kill myself. But um, ended up eating these and uh, one of the chefs, the ladies cooked them up and she said it's one of the best things she's ever had. So it's a marketing problem here. So now look, I mean, the, the, the joy that they have this food that's practically free growing around them that they never knew about. It's a great feeling, right, to enlighten those who, who just don't know. And here are some of the villagers. I was there for a week and they caught wind, they said, hey, I heard they were banging on the doors of the, uh, the hospital where we were staying. They said, oh, I heard there's a mushroom guy here that can grow mushrooms on anything. And so uh, my last night there, uh, it was 10 o'clock at night, um, I actually gave a workshop out in the parking lot with a bunch of kids, teaching them how to grow mushrooms on cardboard and everything. So uh, I left a bunch of spawn, we walked down the street, we started cleaning up the village, which was another um, another side effect of that. You know, that was great. You know, cardboard, coffee, um, banana fronds, and you know, any type of agricultural waste, old clothing scraps that are made of cotton, you can stuff them into a bucket, sprinkle some mushroom spawn, and you're on your way. All right, they're gonna fruit. So I, I spent a lot of time uh, in Haiti and also in Jamaica here down there. When I got to Jamaica, um, I was sent down there by the Farmer to Farmer program to specifically do um, mushroom cultivation workshops of oyster mushrooms primarily. But after I was lecturing down there and targeting, talking about target specific fungi and medicinal mushrooms and um, Termites destroy 50% of the sugarcane on the island. I'm like, oh man, we could fix that. You know, I was like, yeah, man. You know, <laughs> um, the minister wanted to meet me and um, really develop a mushroom industry uh, mycological section over at the University of West Indies. It was in their best interest, you know, to grow mushrooms, to be one with the planet, um, figure out biological solutions on the island. Uh, during one of my medicinal talks, I started talking about magic mushrooms and how they can help uh, PTSD, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, all these different things. And I quickly moved on and they said, hold on a minute, back up. And uh, I'm like, they were like, we want to know more about this. This is fascinating. Um, we could really use this on the island. And I said, well, pff, they're illegal. You know, you can't grow them. And they said, no, 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 no. Jamaica never, never banned mushrooms. So they're totally legal there. Uh, very few countries have this uh, gift <laughs> of them being legal. So uh, I started talking about the effects of uh, magic mushrooms, uh, how, how they're used in clinical settings. Um, we really didn't talk about how to grow them yet. Um, this is just an introduction. And so we started talking about the different species there. And several times my driver, who's with working for the government, um, he would just pull over to cow field and say, hey, let's just look and see if there's anything around here. And you know, we found a bunch of mushrooms growing in the cow uh, fields. Um, he, he started dancing. He's like, oh, I found a bunch over here. And I'm like, no, that's not, they're not good. I don't recognize those as being anything. Um, inactive Penelius or something. And I got back to the truck. By the time I got back to the truck, I looked in my hat and all the mushrooms were bruising dark blue. 
So it turned out to be panscyons, which is Panelia cyanescens. So that was an active species. And also cubensis grows on the island, which is more, it's a more robust species, the one I prefer to grow. So identifying um, psilocybe species would be the bruising blue, uh, gills, and also a black spore print, uh, black dark, purple black spore print. Um, if you find a mushroom anywhere in the world that has a dark spore print and um, gilled and bruises blue, it's active with psilocybin and psilocin. You're welcome. So how does it work? Uh, there's a lot of research here. I'm just going to breeze over it because it's not the, the, the focus of this lecture. Just to show you that these molecules turn off temporarily your default mode network. If you don't know what that is, think of it, uh, your ego is like a firewall. It's a robot. It doesn't think about these things. You just do what you do. And behind and below that, in this really deep ocean of um, your mind, there's all these other thoughts and things going on that you cannot access uh, in your normal everyday consciousness. So you have, while we're diff just kind of dissolving this, uh, you gain access to all these ideas, thoughts, and and, uh, and programs, your, your code essentially, your operating system. You get to look at all that. You get to address it. You get to um, shuffle things around. You get to unplug things, plug things in, right? And typically, you know, dizziness, laughter, abdominal pain from the laughter, <laughs> right? Um, you know, 15 to 30 minutes. And, you know, dosage is everything. If you want a microdose, um, you would do anywhere from 200 to 300 milligrams dried. If you want a, you know, more elevated experience, you go to one to two grams. But typically, if for something that's therapeutic, over that, you should probably have a sitter or be with someone if you're getting into the three, four, and five gram dose. Okay? That's a high dose. Um, at five grams, you're almost immobile for about an hour or two. And that's what's fascinating is that uh, you really need to know mushroom ID if you're going to go out collecting. This is a destroying angel, deadliest, one of the deadliest mushrooms on the planet. Uh, you see the vulva, the cup, like base, it's all white, white gills, white spores, bald, smooth, white cap. Uh, this one cap would probably kill two 160-pound adults. Growing right next to it, psilocybe cubensis here, a little tiny one growing on manure in Florida, you know, active species right next to each other. I get this question a lot. Does that make uh, this proximity make it dangerous to consume this one? No. I mean, they could almost even be touching. There's no cross-contamination here ever. And so um, two years ago, we started growing. Uh, we set up the Blue Portal, which is a, a laboratory and also a um, psychedelic uh, counseling program down in Jamaica. So we started growing um, Cubensis. This was Golden Teacher strains. We had several strains down there. Um, and look how thick and meaty and robust these are. And we're picking them before the veil pops on these. And I'll tell you why. Is uh, Your yield is greatly reduced if they sporulate down on the mycelium because it triggers the mycelium um, to not fruit as much. Right? That's, that's true for oyster mushrooms as well in a, a fruiting room. So you really want to pick mushrooms young and before they start to sporulate back onto the body of the mycelium. And, you know, they also store very well. Uh, they take up less space. They're not as fragile when they're in these little bullet-shaped primordia. Uh, pick them about that stage. And even the little ones will mature small, so you got to be careful. Pick these little ones right when they start to crack. So we rented a car, and we slapped on that magnetic sign to let people know who we were. Um, we were pulling over into fields looking for uh, mushroom people selling them and people who can show us where the fields were so we can collect new strains. So we drove all over the island, the east side. And then this young gentleman we met uh, up at Port Antonio on the northeast side of Jamaica. Um, we're asking him for mushrooms and he goes, oh, I know where they are. And just down the street, he found this cow field and here he is picking um, Penelia cyanescens out in this field, which are active. It was really dry. 
uh, had it been raining, there were black spores everywhere in this grass. You could see big loads of uh, black spores where the mushrooms were. So we found a couple clumps of them scattered throughout this grass. Here's the cultivated uh, golden teachers from our lab. You can see the instantaneous bruising, dark bruising reaction. Uh, it's important to have a, um, a good nitrogen source in that media too, because that, that actually increases the levels of uh, psilocybin in your fruiting bodies. There you have it, just a beautiful glamour shot. Uh, here you see the veil breaking away. You see the black spores on the underside. You, know, you pick these a, a little bit earlier. That's fine. They haven't sporulated a lot. But I would have picked these a little bit earlier. Now you see the cut blue cross section. And there's there's the reward. Our patients who are healing themselves. You know, this gentleman had uh, Lyme disease. We were treating him with an um, uh, epic dose of the uh, Cubensis, followed by a series of microdosing also with the lion's mane fungus for cognitive function. And what's fascinating is wherever you go, anywhere in the world, you can find mushrooms just about, all right? These are tropical oysters falling a fallen tropical tree. And they were everywhere. We filled up a hat full of these. <clears throat> and these can be easily cloned. You can use a cardboard culture technique in my book. Uh, take the stems, wrap them up in wet cardboard, and you can propagate this fungus without a lab. Super easy. And I think that's about it. Um, this is my actual CAT scan of my brain. <laughs> and maybe maybe this is a CAT scan of your brain too. I don't know. Um, but, you know, the way I teach mushrooms is you really have to think like a mushroom. And so take this picture to heart is that really everything we see and do really has to be using mushrooms in mycology. They really will um, change the world and uh, they're a tool in our toolkit right that's not what mushrooms can do for you ask what you can do for mushrooms right and that's it so thank you for watching I hope that you enjoyed the lecture and again I could be reached through mushroommountain.com uh, uh, there's uh, identification courses there for learning mushroom identification that are really good and um, thank you for watching and I really appreciate everything that you will do with mushrooms. Thank you.